Um, so we'll be talking again about um, uh, MapReduce um, uh, map algorithms. And what, what we'll be trying to do today is to um, try to formalize a model of computation for MapReduce and kind of um, relate this to some of the models for, um, um, for doing parallel computation. And so th these, some of these models were, um, it, so these, these relations were done by people trained in theory and algorithms that were written with like these, um, with these big O notations where certain constants get hidden in certain places. And we'll try and look at these and dissect them and see how reasonable these models are and then see what we can actually learn um, from doing this. What, you know, given all this theoretical thing with big O, did we actually get anything out of it? And so it, it'll be, it'll be a good day to try and discuss certain assumptions which are made along the way and how reasonable those are. Um, and there, there are several attempts at this and we'll kind of uh, uh, progress through them. And uh, um, so we'll see. So, so, so let me keep going. Okay, so we're going to have, um, um, the input is going to be some massive um, data. And we're going to say that the size of this is going to be n um, in, the, in the lecture today. And so then, um, so then if you remember, MapReduce is going to have these two phases. Um, it's going to have the mapper, um, which is going to take, um, it's, it's going to have this, um, we'll, we'll say that I'm going to use, um, so we'll say that this massive data d, um, d is, is going to be the union. Um, it's going to be um, D1 union uh, D2 um, union D uh, K. So, so in all these pieces, and you're going to take some piece of this um, DI, and you're going to um, and and so each you're going to have that you're going to have a key value pair which is going to be in, in each di, and each of these is, is going to be output to a set of these um, key value pairs. And so, so, so we're going to process each of these elements from the set individually. The data is somehow divided up in a way that we don't have so much control over, um, at least initially. Um, okay. And so then, in the second phase, we're going to have a reducer. And so, um, so, so what the reducer gets as its input is going to be for each of the keys and the output here, it's going to get the key, and then it's going to get the set also of all the values that are associated with this key. So V1, V2, up to uh, Vt. And it's going to output, again, um, a set of key value pairs. Okay, and so then these key value pairs are going to go um, out to um, this. And so this is actually going to get to put out to a um, distributed file system. And so then the next round. You can then iterate and have another round of MapReduce where you have another mapper running on the output of this. So there's this magical shuffle phase which happens in between these where all the key value pairs here, they get aggregated based on their key. And so this is somehow done magically and, and this is all done behind the scenes. It does load balancing. If machines go down, it handles that automatically. Um, okay. Um, Right. Okay. Um, so this is um, so this is MapReduce, and uh, you basically the goal is usually to do this some constant number of rounds and get something written out on 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 disk here, and it's most effective usually when the input is really large that you want to make it parallelized, and the output is also very large that it's something you want to write out to disk. Um, if you just want a small thing in memory, you may uh, want to use use something. Um, okay, so um, so this was uh, you know came out of Google around um, uh, 
from 2003 or so, uh, paid for 2004, and it kind of took off in the um, in the late 2000s, and so then um, around. So, um, so, so what we're going to do today is try and um, relate this model of computation, which is seems to be restrictive in that you're dealing with these data elements and going through these mapper reducer phase where you can only aggregate by key and try and map these to some more well-known models for parallel algorithms. So we'll see how to um, um, simulate a, um, so, so we want to um, simulate um, some of these different models. So the exclusive read, exclusive write, uh, PRAM, so in, um, um, in MapReduce. So if you have any algorithm that works for exclusively, exclu exclusive read, exclusive write PRAM, which is the most kind of um, most restrictive model of PRAM, um, but probably the most practical, then you can get it working in MapReduce, right, with some, with some overhead. Um, we'll also mention um, how to do um, concurrent read and concurrent write um, PRAM in MapReduce and also um, this VSP model in MapReduce. So, so if you remember, these assume that you had a memory which was shared um, and that you have processors which could act on it and they could go and access the, the memory um, each in constant time and processing constant time. Um, this is when each part of memory can only be read and written to by one of the processors at a time. This is when all of them could be read and written to in, in a constant time. Um, and then the VSP model is where, is, is where you don't have shared memory, is where you have um, each processor has its own memory and it's not shared. And so, and you communicate in between the processors in a series of rounds, or um, as these were known as, as um, super rounds. And so people designed a variety of algorithms in these settings, and, um, and it's been very well studied. And we'll show that you can map some of these into algorithms uh, from MapReduce, so you don't have to reinvent all these algorithms again. Um, okay. Um, all right, so. Let's go a little bit about the history of where this took place. So th there was a model called MUD um, that came out in around 2008, where most people in, I think most people were not too aware of, uh, of MapReduce at this point. Google had been going around giving talks about it, but people are just dismissing it. You know, why was Google? that much better than everyone else. And um, so this MUD map model stood for um, <coughs> Massive um, Unorganized and um, Distributed. And see, this was by a bunch of authors, um, um, Feldman, um, Muthu and um, a few other people. Um, so so um, this was kind of a first attempt at formalizing this model, and it it kind of had some a lot of discussion about things, and it took a while for this paper to get accepted to to a conference. Um, and it turns out it didn't really show anything that actually was all that. Um, uh, was all that useful. Basically, it showed that it, it restricted th that the um, reducer size was O of um, log n to a c. So, so, was, so, so the size of the reducer was restricted to be log of the size of your data to the power um, to some for some constant c, so some polylog c, and it showed that if you're doing any, um, any um, linear sketching algorithm, 
Um, so th this was like the count min sketch we talked about. Um, then you can do this in you can do this in MapReduce. Now, this is not really that surprising in retrospect, at least. At the time, people really didn't know what to, what to think of this. Um, the linear sketching algorithms, they were such that you had this kind of linear combination of things you had in this, in this table, and you could just add together the tables, and that would retain all the properties. Um, so this, this, this wasn't really that, that su surprising in retrospect, but it was kind of a first attempt at understanding this model. Okay, so then, um, let's see. In, then there was another model by um, um, Karloff, um, Suri, and um, um, Vasilvinsky um, in 2010, and this is called the MRC model. Um, so this is supposed to be the MapReduce computation. And so the, the restriction here was that there was some, um, some constant, um, epsilon, which is greater than zero, think of like um, EG epsilon, it was like one fourth or something, right? Um, and then you said that the reducer um, size um, was at most n to the one minus epsilon. So the epsilon could be like, uh, it could also maybe be like one tenth, something like some small constant. And the, the number of processors was restricted to be um, n to the two minus epsilon. So you could have almost n squared processors. Um, and that if this was true, then you could um, simulate um, ER, um, EC, um, PRAM. So this is the, the most strict PRAM. Um, you can do it in MapReduce in um, with, uh, uh, oh yes, sorry. Exclusive, exclusive right there. Yeah, um, with, with only this many processors. So you now only need uh, processors which are smaller than the size of your data. Um, and the, the rounds, the number of rounds you needed was going to be below log C. Okay, so this. Okay, can you tell again what all these assumptions are? Yeah, okay. So, it's, um, so we'll go through these assumptions and I'll try and break these down. So this is not, so these are kind of the first two models and not the ones that I think are very illustrative. Um, although this one did lead to some nice algorithms, people, this kind of introduced the model to algorithms, people started looking at some and developing some stuff. Um, but I don't think the model is that actually useful. So that's saying, so if you're in, if you're working in PRAM and you have exclusive read and exclusive write properties, so this is was supposed to be the, the kind of the, the most realistic model for PRAM things where you had um, shared nothing, um, or you had completely shared memory, but only one processor could access each piece of memory at a time. And you restrict, so okay, so now there are these restrictions on like the reducer size. So your data is of size n, and you don't, you need to have it to be some polynomial in n, which is less than one. So you can't put all the data on one machine. If you could put all the data on one machine, then you just do it on one machine. Um, but you, you really like to get speed up with more processors. So in the, if you look at a model in PRAM where you had a large number of processors, so you could do a lot of parallelization. Um, so about n squared processors, in fact. So you could do these, these tricks like where you did n squared things in, in constant time. Um, if you can do that, then What's any. The reducer size? So, so then what? What does the reducer size? So this is the reducer size. This is in the MapReduce model where you are mapping things to a reducer. You can't put all the data on one reducer. 
right? So, so this restriction says you can't map, you can't map everything to one reducer and then have that one reducer handle it. So you you have to you you, um, you have to uh, use distributed processing to handle all the data. It won't fit on the hard drive of that machine. So so that's what this this restriction is saying. Um, so and this restriction is saying you in the in the PRAM model you can't have more you can't look at algorithms that use more than n squared processors for a few n pieces of data. Um, it seems like that's not a very strong restriction, um, but maybe there are some weird things you can do if you have more processors. I'm not an expert in, in all things PRAM, but well, um, if we have if you have n pieces of data and we have n squared processors, then the map step becomes trivial. You just assign one thing per processor. Well, it's, it depends what you need to do, right? So, True. So th there are some non-trivial things, like uh, compute the minimum spanning tree of a graph where each data element is going to be um, an edge of the graph. So how do you, how, how do you compute the minimum spanning tree? And so th this is one of the things that they worked out, and this actually came up with a somewhat reasonable algorithm. And we'll actually discuss that argument in detail next week on Wednesday. I'll, uh, next week, Wednesday, I'll go in depth in another kind of non-trivial map use algorithm. And it came out of thinking about it in this framework. And it actually kind of makes sense. It uses this idea of filtering where you kind of reduce the, you can reduce the data set size in a series of rounds. So, um, so, so what this basically means is this. We have a data set of n elements, OK? Yeah. And we have a settings in, P, in e, PRAM where we have at most n square processor. Then for any algorithm, yes, okay, that's, that 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 we can do in, in PRAM with at most n square processors, we can also do in a map reduce model with the following limitations. That uh, we can do it, but we are going to spend at, mo at most n processors and at most log c n rounds. Yes. Okay, what I don't understand is why is how can why why the, why there's a limitation on the reducer size at the beginning? Because so you say because this is a weird you know, when you do implication you can do the assumption is one. You know, for every algorithm that spends at most n squared processors in P round, and it will produce at most reducer size for them. That's <coughs> weird. Because you don't know what the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. And you just give if this holds then this Follows, right? Right. So, so for every algorithm in PRAM I'm using n square processes, this follows. But I don't know. I don't understand the assumption of reducer size or that. So the, the, this is another just restriction they put on the problem. I'm not so. I, I don't have a great answer. So I don't know if it if it's required inside of their proof. Um, but they put that restriction on the problem because they thought that was a reasonable thing to assume. If you're modeling things in matters that you couldn't fit everything on one reducer, um, they, uh, um, they, they didn't want to do. They wanted to limit. The goal in doing this was to not do too much total work, where you don't. You look at the the cost of all the computation, and you limit the number of rounds. Their goal was to limit the number of rounds. They. This was 2010. All people had access to. The, these people were mainly at Yahoo. Uh, these, these two guys were at Yahoo, uh, Howard Karloff was at at t so they only had access to Hadoop, and Hadoop had this issue where there's a lot of latency between the rounds. And so their goal says we want to say we don't need too many rounds. And so they say log to the power C um, and rounds. And what they did is they classified different algorithms, say, you know, there's a class of algorithms where the constant C is 1, where the constant C is 0. So if it's zero, that means if log to the zero end rounds, that means there's a constant number of rounds. And so you wanted algorithms that had a constant number of rounds. But there's always possible to get it for some C, and the goal was to get this, this constant C as small as possible. And you could classify it based on the power of the log. To, to me, it's just not clear which algorithms can now really be translated in the average model given. Well, so, um, so let me. Uh, uh, let me uh, 
kind of put this on hold and, and give you the, uh, there's a follow-up paper to this that has a, okay. uh, th that I think has results which are more useful. Okay. Okay, so, um, let's see, so then there's a paper um, um, by Goodrich. Um, Not BYU Goodrich, is it? No, he's at uh, 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 UCI. Uh, okay. Um, this is Michael Goodrich, so. Um, oh, but it is another Michael. Yeah, um, apparently there's a lot of uh, people named uh, Michael Goodrich. What is his, he, I forget his yeah. middle initial, but he's at, um, there are probably even more people named Zong. This is Chin Zong. This came out in 2011. And so, okay, so, so let me, So the, the, this one required a bit more setup. Um, so, so I'll get, I'll, maybe I'll tell you the, so some of the main high level things um, and, and then I'll go back and, and go through some of the setup. But it said if you have a BSP algorithm, um, so in R, um, super steps. Um, so, so, so that was the number of times that you communicated in between the uh, the, the different uh, processors, which had which didn't share any memory. Um, so with the memory, um, um, with the memory size of M. Um, BSP in this context again is uh, so, so so BSP is a, is a model of parallel computation uh, where I, I talked about in the in the overview of the parallel section. Right, I've temporarily yeah. forgotten what it stands yeah. for. Yeah, so it's um, uh, so um, um, it's called box uh, um, synchronous parallel. So you do. So, so you do a bunch of stuff in parallel, and then you exchange all the data, and you wait, and then you do a bunch of stuff in parallel. And it's, it, sh it should seem, if you remember, it should seem very similar to how the MapReduce operates in that. It has these rounds where each mapper or reducer is doing stuff on its own. Um, okay, so. Um, so. so you have um, the number of processors need to be less than the size of the memory. Um, and then you can do this in, in, in MapReduce. Uh, so in, in R rounds, so the same number of rounds as this, if you had super steps in here, um, with uh, um, with the um, total communication um, equals to O of R times N, and with the uh, this is the reducer size um, M. This was equal to over and over P. So basically, you can, so what they wanted to, uh, um, and I'll go back and go through this uh, more, caref uh, more carefully, but they wanted to minimize the amount of total stuff communicated. And with, with some some bound on the on the memory size of each reducer, and they said if you can do it in BSP, where they have a limit on the memory size of each of the of of, of the processors, and you could also do it in MapReduce. Uh, what does the communication mean? I mean, the bound on communication. So, um, um, so I'll come. So it's the total amount of of data communicated in between nodes across all of the shuffle steps. So if you do MapReduce, the only time you communicate between 
computers is going to be in the shelf of stuff. And the only bound that the, the, the communication. Um, and one more thing, man. The reducer size in the previous step, does it mean the other time size? Uh, that the, it is limited by yeah, the so, so, memory size. So there's, um, so, so when you're doing MapReduce, you can, so ideally, in the, in the, between the map step and the reduce step, you only want the reducer to get enough information that it can fit it in its memory. It does, the reducer does not need to write the disk um, before the end of the round. Um, that's not necessarily true. So sometimes you will accidentally extend it too much and it'll have to buffer stuff on disk before it can handle it. Um, but you'd like to design an algorithm where that doesn't happen. So we're trying to say what is the size of the memory on the on each of the reducers. And so this is should be reminiscent of these external memory algorithms, these highly efficient algorithms, where you have this parameter on the memory size which affects how fast your algorithms run. And, and that's going to be the case under this model. So they're trying to model MapReduce after the IO efficient model of computation, where they're looking at the movement of blocks of data as well. This result is not surprising, right? Uh, no, it's not surprising. Okay. But, but people, you know, the, the only previous result said, we're going to try and do exclusively exclusive right PRAM, which you know, it doesn't seem like a good fit. These guys said, you know, you should really be mapping it to BSP. So they were the first one uh, suggesting that you should look actually BC, BSP, which is a similar um, Yeah, so this was published in 2010, but this paper took a while to get published. It was actually around a couple years earlier. But people, I guess they didn't think it was that surprising, but uh, no one had, you know, shown how to do this before. So, whereas this paper actually, this paper got a lot of attention. This paper did not get a lot of attention. They, they also showed other other things in here, um, and this was via an existing reduction from from. Uh, There's also concurrent read, concurrent write, um, um, PRAM. Um, so, so, so there's this other model, PRAM, where you can concur concurrently read, concurrently write. So this is not as uh, usually as a uh, um, realistic model for PRAM, uh, but this model showed a much better re uh, reduction than the exclusively exclusive PRAM. Yeah. So, I know that, I mean, theoretically this is interesting, but when I'm, when I'm interested in that, when I have the following question. So you always want to show some equivalence or reduction when you want to, when you have, uh, especially in terms of computation, when you want to prove that some model is stronger or equally express right. the other one. So BSP, as far as I know, is just an abstract model, right? It's, it's, right. A, it's a model that you can implement and it works. But yeah. what, 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 what would be the benefit of proving that MapReduce can be just as good as BSP? Can it be well, the, so what the benefit is, is people had been designing algorithms to work in BSP for a while. So now you can take these algorithms and you can run them in or run them in MapReduce. And I'll give some examples of ones why they might be uh, kind of interesting. Uh, but I'll, I, I need to set some, so we'll talk about, um, so, so for instance, you can show, you can essentially do sorting in a constant number of rounds by, via this reduction from PSP. Um, I'll talk more about sorting, um, so how does, does in, this in, reduction in another, only what? Say, does this reduction only say we have an algorithm? There exists an algorithm. Well, you can, you can actually, it's a reduction, so you can actually um, instantiate okay. down. You can actually write down what it is. Now, uh, it's, the thing about the reduction is they're going to have some overhead. They're not going to be probably the best reduction. And there's a lot of asymptotics, you know, here that's that's hiding what's, what's, you know, the real thing. But this should be, what you should use this as is you can look at how people have done this in these algorithm study in BSP or, or in CR, CW, PRAM and say, here's a good starting point for how to do this, and then let's try and get rid of some of the rounds and some of the overhead. So I'm, I'm not aware of the history of BSP, but this, is a, this was a popular or it's a popular model, and we have plenty of algorithms for this model or what? So, so there are um, I know that probably not as many as PRAM, PRAM yeah. um, but it's, it's still, still a fair number. Um, so, 
you know, the BSP model was one of the things that um, that Les Gillian won the the won the training work. Yeah, so that's what I'm but, asking because obviously there's more data than that. Yeah, so I mean, it kind of came out because people were dissatisfied with PRAN, um, but a lot of the excitement of parallel algorithms had died down by the time DSP came out. Um, so not as much work came out afterwards inside BSP. But there are known, so one of the good things is there's a known reduction, a fairly efficient reduction from BSP, or from CRCWP RAM to BSP. Um, and, that, and that allowed them, this paper to go from CRCWP RAM to BSP to two matrices. So, so, so th this, this way of doing these reductions that said any algorithm studied in this form of PRAM, you can then translate to MapReduce, and then you need to look at it and see, well, does this actually make sense in what we're doing? But the high-level concept should, it should go. Um, what would be the advantage of taking an algorithm designed for, say, CRCW PRAM and trying to implement it with Hadoop just to just the hope that you can make use of the Hadoop infrastructure without having to spend five years developing a competing product? Or well, so the what the benefit is is that. Um, no, you at least know that such an algorithm exists now. I don't just know you can simulate it before that. It didn't right, work. right. So there's there's a lot of algorithms that you didn't people that didn't know how to do in MapReduce. So now people know at least there is some way how to do it. It may not be. Optimized yet, right? But there is something at a high level that that, um, that, that should work. So I, how about I write this down, and then we're going to kind of back up and kind of go through some of the details and how realistic some of these these uh, these these different assumptions are. Um, okay, so, so 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 let's say so this is um, so with um, T. Steps and P, um, uh, P processors. Um, is going to be of T n plus P or M plus P. Okay. So the, the big difference between here and here <coughs> is that you're going to have so you need to deal with these, these steps are not as, as concise as these are super steps, which you're trying to do. The big difference is you have this extra, extra log factor. But it's important to note that this is a log base M. Um, so, so now, um, th th there's, so, so if you assume, um, the important thing to note is that if M is equal to uh, um, N to the, let's say, alpha uh, um, for some alpha, which is N0, 1. So, so let's say uh, alpha equal to, say, 1 half, so it's square root N. Um, then, then O of log M N is actually equal to O of 1. OK? 
Okay, so so this this log this log bound is actually probably going to be a constant if the memory size is n to the n to the alpha, right? N is the size of your data. Now, uh, um, this memory size m is the memory size on a single on the reducer size, the size on, on a single machine. So how realistic is this n, n to the alpha assumption? Um, okay, so, so I want to break this down for a second. And I worked out some example numbers here. Um, so, so let's say that the n is equal to 1, um, uh, um, is equal to 1 billion. And I, I want to look at a couple of things. So what is log base 2 of n? And what is n to some, some constant? Right? So let's see how big these numbers actually are. Right? So log base 2 of n, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be roughly 30. Okay? But we have these things, we have these other terms here where we say this is log n to the to the power c, what does, what if I take this to the power of some small power, log base 2 of n to the power uh, 3, this is going to be about 27 um, k, 27,000. Um, log base 2 of n to the power 4, right, so the, the, this is already going to be about 810,000. Isn't that notation also calling out log C and N? Okay. Right, right. So I'm just trying to put some numbers to these constants, right? So, you know, in, 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 in algorithms, you can write this big O with the constant, right? But what do these mean with some numbers like a billion, right? How do, how do these compare? When you do, and, and when you do a log, 2n to the power 6 already, you're already at about 730 a million. Mm -hmm. So to the power 6, you're already all the way back up almost to a billion. Okay, so if you're up to the power 6, this is already, you're, you're not really saying much at all. Okay, so um, now let's look at um, some n to the 1 half. So, so th this is going to be about um, um, 31,000, right? So if I went down to n to the 1 fourth, this will put me down around, around 200, right? So even at a billion, n to the 1 fourth is pretty small. It's not quite as small as log n, but, you know, it's, it's not so big. And I'm talking about this as this usually comes up in the size of in the, the size of the memory, right? You're at least going to have be able to hold 200 things in memory, right? Even 31,000 uh, things is, is probably, probably reasonable. Um, let's just write some other numbers. N to the 3 fourths is going to be about 5.6 million. So th this may actually be reasonable to fit in memory. So you could put into the 3 fourths thing in memory of the machine. You could have this much memory. Something, even if you go n to the um, 0 0.95, you're going to get um, to only about 350 million. So the thing about the powers is that even as this gets close to 1, you're still not that close to a billion. N to the log, log n to the 6 is getting close to a billion, log n to the 7th is way more than a billion. It's already worthless, right? But even these powers a little bit less than one, you're gonna you're gonna be pretty far below a billion. You're gonna really reduce your size. Um, so probably enter the point nine. You'd be able to, um, the, the, you know, so if, if epsilon here you reduce your size is point one, then you only had ten machines. Then this is actually kind of reasonable. So these these numbers are not. You know, when you first see them, you know, the first time I saw these papers and I saw these n to the 1 minus epsilon, like, you know, this is different from a lot of other algorithm analysis. You usually say these log n's to the sum power are way less than, than the polynomials. But 
even on big data, a, a, a billion points, the, you know, the difference is, is not so much. So it's important to kind of realize that these, these uh, end of the sum powers is actually a pretty decent, pretty decent reduction. Um, so, yeah, so if you, you know, if you're taking it, your advanced algorithms class, probably one of the first assignments you have is you get a bunch of these different things and you have to rank them based on their asymptotics. Um, yeah. I, I don't think all that is actually that useful. Um, it's good to, for a certain understanding, but uh, I mean, clearly n squared is going to be bigger than log into the fourth property. Uh, but in practice, polynomials could be smaller than logs to some power. Okay. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to try and now, how are we doing? I'm going to try and talk a little bit more about what's trying to go on in this model. What are the, how do they try and relate this to the external memory model and why does that make sense? And then talk about some of the algorithmic implications of it. Um, uh, but is this kind of Put it in context a little bit. Uh, okay. Are there? Okay. So, so are people? Is is this too too high level? Is have I have I lost people or? Um, okay. So I'll, I'll I'll try and I'll try and break down this model a little bit more, and then we'll discuss some. So, okay, so we already have that R is going to be the number of rounds. We're going to say that, and then we're going to talk about the, on a, on a mapper, N um, I R is going to be the, um, is going to be the amount of, of the I.O. on um, mapper I in round R, right? So we deal with really big data. Remember, every round of mappers, now this is not necessarily true in Spark, as, as I mentioned, which is this new system which is coming out. Uh, but every round of mappers, you're reading stuff off of disk. Okay, so you should, when you're reading stuff off a disk, you should be looking at the number of IOs that you have to do. This is, is typically going to dominate the amount of cost. So you should look at the IOs um, that, that's required in the algorithm. Um, and then, uh, so, so the, this should be the base unit of, uh, of um, um, oh wait, this is, so this is the amount of I/O of the mapper, and also this is reading off a disk and sending to a reducer, right? So when you think of I/Os in a single, so so when you had a single system before, right, where you had this CPU and the memory, and then you had had the disk, right, um, and you're looking at this. Um, this, this I.O. gap. You're looking at reading from disk and then writing back to disk. But now you're going to be mainly reading from disk and then you're writing out um, to the network. You're doing this in the, in the shuffle phase. Right, so, the, it's, so what you count on the mapper is the amount of I.O.s it needs to read in and the number of I.O.s in the size of blocks that you're sending that are going out on this mapper in this in the shuffle. This is really what you should be counting. And these are sent again in blocks. So these are sent in these, um, well you, you can, there are different ways of saying them, but I think you can generally think of these as, as, as the cost of transferring a block. Yeah. Uh, the IO in the shuffle is not necessarily arising to a disk. It can be between different nodes. 
Right. right. So, so this is, is not going necessarily to disk. So this is the, the this has to do with the bandwidth of, of the network as opposed to the I/O cost. And you know, some would argue you can make a network that's faster than the I/O cost of disk. In fact, um, you know, depends on how much you're willing to spend on that. There, there may be on roughly the same order of magnitude. All that we are concerned here is IOs. We're going to count the IOs. So this doesn't make sense. Let's say that we have one problem where we just want to find the minimum, okay, which is linear, and, the I, and then the other problem is we have the trial Excel no problem, which we know it takes exponential time, and the number of IOs would be the same. We have the same n elements. So and then obviously well, yeah. the time that we spend solving the, these problems, one is linear, the other is exponential. So, so you actually do care what you do in the CPU. Uh, that's true. So you probably okay. So you probably care even more what you do. Yeah. I think this so, is so this is example when you care more what you do in CPU than. What so it it's so you're still gonna so you're only gonna be using you probably be using MapReduce if you have it's best when you have a lot of data that does not fit on any one machine. So you have so much data, you really need to be communicating between um, the different nodes. So you may be doing a lot of computation on the, on the CPU for some of this, but in most typical problems, the the, the actual runtime is bound by the I/O. That's the, that's the typical case, and so that's what they're what they're bothering. There are there are problems like traveling salesmen, where. Uh, you know, okay, I, uh, let's, I, let's, I, let's do shortest path, right? Yeah. Okay, you can you can define, you can have an algorithm, what, what's a simple algorithm, some simple algorithm that we can do in sublinear time, mm -hmm. linear time. Mm -hmm. Well, for shortest path, we know we, you need, let's say, n log n, okay? So, and then you're saying that these two algorithms are completely equal, because they have to keep the same amount of files. So, where... So, so, so we're looking. So, so, so this is goes back to this uh, this this IO model of computation. It doesn't always fit. So, but it, for really large problems where the uh, the the actual cost is the movement of data, which is typical for these, this is a good way to think about them. If your problem is very CPU intensive, um, then this may not be the right way to model. So the um, so these are good things to bring up, right? So it's not always going to be the best model. You need to look at what you're actually doing. But for most sort of things people run on MapReduce, it's 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 really I/O intensive. Um, so 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 it, so then essentially the um, the cost for the uh, communication of a uh, round, we'll call that CR, is um, is the total communication uh, they write as sum of n i r. So it's the sum of all the IOs on all these things. Whether it should be the sum or the max, you know, that's something else. Um, they have a different thing that looks at the max here. Um, and then and then they're going to have a value C, which is going to be the sum over R of CR. And then they also have, so this is the total communication, and maybe this costs something because it, there's uh, associated with the amount of energy you need to spend. There's also um, a bound on the, on the total time. Um, and so you have a... Um, <coughs> TR, which is going to be the um, basically the time associated with the round. Um, so this is um, um, round R, and the, the claim is that um, T TR is going to be greater equal to the max um, of I of of n i r. Okay, so so they're not claiming that this is upper bounding the amount of time. They're saying that the i o cost is lower bounding the amount of time. When you look at the the maximum i o cost of any of the methods. 
And so then, of course, you have T is the sum over all the rounds and TR. Right? So um, because you need to run the rounds sequentially, you can sum these up. Um, so now, um, in order to understand how this fits together, you need to look at other parameters, which, which have been changing as the systems have, have evolved. You have L, um, which is the latency of the shuffle. So is there an overhead in, in doing the shuffle in addition to actually sending out the data? Um, and there's L. also... The shuffle meaning the stuff you have to do in between the In routes. between the map and the reduce. So it, oh, after okay. the end of the mapper, it sets up the reduce route. How long does it, those latency in setting up a, um, in, in setting up this route. Not counting the, the cost of the communication, but there's some overhead on the master node in doing the schedule and something like that. Um, in, in certain implementations of Hadoop, there's also some like booting up of the individual JVMs on each of the machines that you had to redo and there was some latency involved in that. Um, so one last parameter. Um, um, so this is the bandwidth of the shuffle. Um, uh, uh, on the bandwidth of the shuffle, um, of the shuffle network. So this is saying that you know all these processors are trying to the mappers and reducers are trying to communicate at once. They can't all talk at once. There's some bandwidth on here. And so th this is, um, so it's basically the number of elements um, uh, that can be communicated in, you know, in, in one uh, unit of time. Okay, so if you think, so if you think this is, is a lot of parameters, there's a paper out by, uh, um, uh, 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 by Shibnath Babu and uh, Iridopoulos that has like uh, like five pages worth of parameters that go into a map reduce algorithm. And then they try and put all these parameters into some sort of uh, optimization for a given problem and optimize how you should run your algorithm. Um, so, the, so these, this is an attempt to try and come up with what are the core things you need to look at. And this is, the, the, these are kind of needed in order to translate the amount, the, 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 the different things which are really controlling the, 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 um, the bottlenecks in most map reduce algorithms. Yeah. So I have a few questions. Yeah. Just like discussing, right? So communication. Oh, well, well, let me write one e equation. So the time is then roughly going to be um, T plus RL plus, um, plus C over B. So that's how they fit these all, try to fit these all together. So that's the function you want to get away. Okay. So you're trying to, so, so the time has to do with the maximum IOs for any one round. We also have the total communication, which is the sum over all of these. And this is, is divided, uh, um, this is divided by the bandwidth. Okay, and this is the total over all the rounds. And you also have a latency for each of the rounds. So, so, so if this latency really reduces because you're running Spark, um, then, you, then the amount of optimization you need to do per round is really going to decrease. Okay, so uh, I just want to talk about some, a few assumptions. So communication rounds, right? So we assume that each, we assume when we were talking about that, each uh, computer node um, has served about the same amount of data, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's usually about correct. Okay, so, uh, and then, just, I, I know maybe I'm wrong, but it's, it's not that hard to show that in a more than nice time and some randomized way of splitting the data, actually communication around this constant. Uh, 
Because, the, because the, 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 well, well, uh, uh, where are you saying which, what, 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 what part is constant? Communication. The, the amount of communication per round is I mean constant. constant. It's, it is, it is with, with corresponding with n at the number of nodes that we have. But if we, both, if we fix these things, it's constant. So it depends on how you design your algorithm. There are some, you have some yeah, yeah, choices but, but in the algorithm to make this larger. Yeah, yeah I, I agree that you can design a algorithm really stupid way. But the assumptions were that if we distribute data equally to the machines, right, then each machine would spend about the same time on the mapper. Well, there's part of this reading in the mapper and part of this writing out to the reducer. Yeah, but if you distribute it in a, in a, in a random fashion, okay, you expect your expected time to be. Well, so all the machines have equal time of writing it out. Um, so let's go back. Let's go back to this this algorithm for counting triangles, and let's say that um, each each of the mappers gets um, a gets some vertex and all of its edge lists, and a lot of the mappers get vertices which have a small degree, but one mapper gets the vertex. Uh, with Ashton Kutcher, who has yeah, a million know, things, you, you and, you ran, just, yeah. and you ran the algorithm where you had to send out um, all pairs, and that mapper has a much larger time. Now, yeah, I'm, now, I'm not saying that's the right algorithm, but this is a way of telling you that that's the wrong algorithm. It yeah. may have been obvious otherwise, yeah. but this this is a way of formalizing this. So that's what this is. I, trying to do. So yeah, I, I agree. But I'm just saying, let's say that. For a given problem, you are able to design such an algorithm, such an algorithm okay? then the communication around would be constant, right? It would be the same for all the nodes. Okay? So it, it would be it would be the same across nodes, and and the max would be something like uh, the you know the sum divided by the number of processors. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, that's something you would like to do. Yeah, and then also if you if you go along with this. Shuffle in space with this randomness and uh, bandwidth, it's also uh, you wouldn't shuffle in such a way that you would actually um, cause the network to, to just to get overflow. To get overflow. So, yeah. right, so, so what this, what this B I'm not saying, that, I'm not saying you, that you can do this for every algorithm, but for so, so, so let's look at another algorithm that they actually look at in their paper. So they say, uh, um, let's, um, let's compute the prefix sum, okay? Right, the, the prefix sum was the algorithm where you had a sorted list of elements and you, you wanted to come up with the, at, at every location, the sum of all the elements that came before it, including that element, right? So how that worked is you had all of this, um, th this, this data and you combined two of these 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 um, these things together, um, and you reduce the size by half, and this was one round, and then you reduced the size by half again. This is another round, and then you came here, um, and you, you got the full sum of everything, and then you kind of backed everything up. So order to log in. Yeah. You had the had the whole result here, right? So. Um, so this was this was basically what the algorithm for prefix sum looked like. Okay, so now when you're running this algorithm, at one phase, most of the mappers are actually idle. Right? The, the, this is pretty much the right way to do it, um, but most of the mappers are going to be idle here. Well, this may not actually be the right way to do it. We'll discuss next week, Friday, a different approach for these these sorts of problems. Um, but so, um, so, so how would you translate this algorithm into doing this in MapReduce? Okay, so instead of dividing the size by two, you are going to um, um, you're going to aggregate together. You're going to aggregate together elements of size m. Right? So you're going to put M of these elements together. These are what fits in, in one of the mappers. Right? So this is one mapper. It gets out a total sum. 
right? And then it, and then it, you can take, you know, um, you know, there's going to be m mappers like they're going to, um, uh, um, they're going to come down together. And now, by remembering this fact here, if the size of the that you can fit inside of a mapper or inside of the reducer inside of the memory is some polynomial, say n to the one half of the total data size, and this takes a constant number of runs. It takes a constant number of runs to get to here, another constant number of runs. So you can do the prefix sum at a constant number of runs. Um, so, um, so, this, so this is an example where you can take this algorithm from, from PRAM and map it into MapReduce to a constant number of rounds um, and, and solve this prefix sum. Okay, so, so there, there are a couple of things that are going on behind the curtains here a little bit I want to spend just a little bit of time discussing. Um, so, and then I'll mention a couple other algorithms. So basically this, if m equals n alpha, this basically means it's an, uh, it's, a, it's an idea of a divide and conquer approach. So yeah, so you can still do divide and conquer, but with a constant number of runs. Yes. Usually divide and conquer, you think of it taking log n runs, mm -hmm. which usually in MapReduce is too much, right? You, you, like you don't want to do 30 rounds, you want to do a constant number of runs. You definitely don't want to do log squared n, which is, that's going to be like 800, or this is, I guess it's going to be like 900 rounds. That would, that would be way too many. Right, so you want to do a constant number of rounds, and and with memory sizes that are polynomials, which seems seems reasonable, you know, then then you can do it in a constant number of rounds. Okay, so so this is one kind of by by using these ideas, you you get this sort of value. Okay, so one thing that kind of you you think you can do in in a in PRAM models or BSP models or whatever, is you can you can say I'm going to send this data to this processor. Now in MapReduce you don't have like you don't have that ability. The the processors are not assigned by you. You can't send to a specific reducer. The master node is going to take it based on the key and is going to send. I'll everything with that key to some reducer. That reducer will do that job associated with that key. Okay, so 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 how do we um, so how do we do this? There are, there are some ways where you can kind of hack what's going on, and you can send it to a specific processor. And um, if you're at at the data group yesterday, Ming Wang gave a talk where he was doing some like really cool stuff inside of MapReduce, and it seemed like for a while like he was doing. He was kind of hacking what was going on. He was saying stuff to specific processors. But really, if you're careful, you aren't actually doing that. What you're doing is you're saying, I know there are going to be, there are going to be some number of processors here. So this round is going to need processor 1, processor 2, processor, processor 3, up to processor k. Now you need to do computation. Right? I'm going to have an idea of how, big, how many mappers I originally have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the key, you know, depending on if it's if it should go to processor i, then I'm going to set the key equal to i. So I just have to do that, and then I send all my data with some, you know, in this case as a key value pair coming out of my out of my map step with the key equal to i. That maps it to the right processor essentially, and then. I can put whatever structure I want here in the value, which passes the data. Um, so, um, so now what's happening is that you're sending it, you're, you're describing there's going to be some job that needs to happen this round, and now the master node is able to schedule this as it sees fit. Right? It says, I have these processors available, and I'm going to try and schedule these jobs. If one of them goes down, that's OK. I can then push it off. To, a, to another processor and finish that job. So that even sending to these processors is not actually cheating in some way. You can do that by using the keys in that, in that sense. Okay. Um, so this prefix sum is one hour. The one of the, um, 
another interesting thing you can, you can get out of this model is that you can do sorting. Um, it's time for sorting. Um, you can do it in R equals log M um, and um, so it can be this many rounds, which if M is a polynomial of N, then this is a constant. Um, and the total um, and the total amount of communication is going to be um, N log M N. Right, so again, this log M N, this is like in the, this IRA efficient model where this had to be this log M over B. This is really probably going to be a constant. So again, we're basically doing sorting in, in linear time, or in linear amount of communication, which is a problem. Um, I'll talk, and next week, Friday, I'll talk a bit more about how you'd actually do, um, it, how you'd actually do sorting and how like, they, they kind of broke this pterosaur challenge, um, which basically takes two rounds. Um, and, uh, and the first round is really a very fast round. So it really only takes, you could basically do it in one real round and after one quick pre-processing. Um, the other interesting thing is um, um, multi-searching. So this is when you have n um, items, and so, so these items are going to be, um, so, so you have n items which are ordered, and you're going to have about O of n, um, or theta of n um, queries to see is, so, so these are n items and these are ordered. And these are, um, you have n queries and you want to see is this item in the set? Okay? Um, or I think maybe you can also ask what's the smallest item that's larger than this, right? So you can actually find the closest item. Um, and so, so you can do this again in R of log M N rounds, and the total communication is going to be it's going to be the same thing here. Okay. So, so why is this why is this interesting? Um, one of the complaints that came out of MapReduce when it was uh, first becoming popular, there was a there was this kind of uh, blog post by Michael Stonebreaker um, and David DeWitt that said something like MapReduce is a giant step backwards, <coughs> and they were comparing this to these large industrial databases, which had been very successful for many years, and uh, that will allow you to do lots of sort of searching, um, you know. To, uh, very, uh, very efficient um, and on your on orderings of on you know if your data is ordered and so forth. And one of the complaints of MapReduce is that it was not very good for doing searching. Um, if you have a single query, you know it's really the wrong thing to do. You have a lot more infrastructure for doing other stuff. But if you have a whole bunch of queries you try to do at once, and this is really where where databases are very useful. You're having lots of customer queries come in at once. Um, then you can do all of these very efficiently. Um, even well, if, you can do this multi-searching efficiently in MapReduce as well. At least even if all of them are almost the same, but just enough different that you can't just cast the result but hand out copies. Um, <laughs> I believe this found still holds. Okay. I, I, I don't I, I don't remember the details, but but I, I don't remember specifying the distribution of them. It should be able to end. Um, so, so I, and again, th th this has gotten through a reduction from these PRAM elements. Why, why did they say that it's step backward? Like, who can, can you write that piece of uh, so, You can't so, find it, though. Well, it, it's, well you, there's, it's, yeah, so it was, it was taken down, they kind of retracted that statement. 
Um, the, 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 the kind of the feeling at the time was that it, this, these large scale databases have been extremely successful and very efficient and very robust and had been very powerful in sorts of queries they could do. Um, and MapReduce was not equipped for doing these things. There were things like, uh, like Hive, which was built on top of Hadoop, which was meant to simulate SQL in MapReduce. And that, that ran horribly slow. So if you're trying to do these same sort of queries in MapReduce, it's not going to work that well. Um, so, uh, so, um, so, so th there was some argument to that, but there's a lot of other things that MapReduce uh, can offer. This multi-searching is, is a very small subset of what you could do in an actual database, right? You can do much more interesting queries. People have worked on other sorts of joint optimizations in, in MapReduce, and you know, they're to, to you know, various degrees of uh, being acceptable. Um, but, it, but you do, you can do these things in reasonable most. Um, so I think I'm out of time. I wanted to mention, I'm going to mention another model which kind of simplifies a little bit this next week Friday. Um, so it'll, it'll kind of, there's a lot of parameters here and I'll try and simplify it to some of the core things you should be looking at and mention some algorithms that work within that model, including um, something like prefix sum but more general. And as well as doing, doing sorting and walk through how you actually do that in practice. Um, okay. Turn it up. Okay. Thank you.